It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so for those of you who are expecting 23 pages uh, or 23 slides of triangle inequalities, unfortunately, I hate to disappoint you. This presentation is going to be a little bit different. Is your mic on? In the back? Can people hear? Okay, cool. Excellent. Great. I'm glad I don't have to tell my jokes twice. Um, so, so basically, the question is, from, from, this, from this talk is, I mean, to some extent, I want to address what for me is, has been historically a really embarrassing question that you get asked all the time. The question is, well, deep down, why are we building a quantum computer? What real, practical, valuable problem do we hope to solve using, using one of these devices? Now, I've always said quantum simulation. Clearly, that is the application that will provide the most value in the shortest time. But what sort of quantum computer are we going to need in order to be able to capitalize on this vision? How many qubits? Are we going to need error correction? Are we not going to need error correction? And how do I know that we're looking at a problem that is both important and hard to simulate using classical devices? And that really is the aim of this work. And it should be seen as kind of complementary, I feel, to Andrew's talk earlier. What we're doing here is we're looking at a much harder problem. We're looking at something that, to the best of our knowledge, the best classical methods for, these, for this, the problem I'm going to be talking about will struggle. And so the aim here that I hope that you guys will take out of this is an idea of what the challenge is right now for quantum computing and how we should improve things, not just on the hardware level, but also on the algorithmic level so that we can capitalize on this vision of building a quantum computer that can solve the world's hard, hard problems in chemistry. So, but first, we have to solve the world's hard problems in pointers. Excellent. That one was easier than nitrogen fixation. So the basic idea behind quantum, quantum simulation is really simple. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to get hard problems, like problems involving photosynthesis, high temperature superconductors, or this problem I'm going to be talking about, about nitrogen fixation. And we'd like to be able to map them directly onto the quantum computer. So the idea behind it is really primitive in some ways. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to get the lie to the quantum computer and get it to trick it into thinking that it's the molecule that you want to simulate. Then, because of universality, you can ask any question that you could ask of the molecule and perform that logical experiment on the device. So at a high level, that's basically what we're, we're looking at. And so what we want for this talk, the question is, well, what is the application that we, we want to look at? And the one that we chose is biological nitrogen fixation. Now, why this topic? You know, a fertilizer doesn't exactly sound like the sexiest thing in the world, especially once you see what most of it's made out of. But um, the point is, is that actually, for fertilizer production, or in particular, in particular, ammonia production, is one of the most costly things on the planet, energetically speaking. It uses up a sizable fraction of our energy budget every year just carrying out this process, known as the Haber process. The Haber process was well, invented by Fritz Haber basically about the turn of the century, and it is arguably one of the most important industrial chemistry processes known. It single-handedly kept Germany in the First World War, and it, as I said, is responsible for almost everything to some extent that we eat. And so, given all this time, you would assume that this process has been optimized to the point where we have wonderful catalysts in order to be able to do this, ideally at low temperatures and pressures. But the truth is, we don't. And that's one of the reasons why it uses up so much energy. Because what we need to do is we need, in order to make this reaction go forward in an industrially scalable way, high temperatures and pressures, and those cost energy. So given all of this, you might think, hey, well, you know, maybe this is just a fundamental thing in nature. Maybe we can't beat this. But unfortunately, compared to the, the true masters of fertilizer production, we know nothing. And the true masters are bacteria. Bacteria have actually found a way to do, take nitrogen from the air, split the triple bond that holds it together, and make ammonia out of this at room temperature and pressures. And if we could find something like this that we could execute on an industrial scale, it would fundamentally change the world. 
But a problem with it is that if we take a look at the, the, the molecule that's responsible for it, this is the active site. It's a little poetic to say this, but the, this is sort of the molecular knife that slices the triple bond that holds together the nitrogen. And so in order to understand how this process works and build a synthetic catalyst that we could actually use in a scalable way, one thing that we'd like to be able to do is simulate this active site in here. Problem is, is that we can't do it. And to give you an idea about how hard this is, even experimentally, until very recently, we didn't know what X is. Yes, I, for those of you, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I can allay this concern. X is not a new element. X is simply an unknown element. In this case, until very recently, we didn't know that that was carbon. So that's how unknown this, uh, uh, this was and how recent this development is that we could even begin thinking about this. So the point is, is that the, despite the fact that, that bacteria use this, this knife, essentially, to cut it, we, our best classical methods really struggle with simulating this. And one of the reasons why they struggle is because of the fact that you, if you take a look at this, this thing is chock full of heavy metals, molybdenum, iron, things with D electrons. And typically, as a rule of thumb, when you see things like that, a lot of classical methods will begin to fail because of the fact you get very correlated electrons as they start moving around these heavy positive charges. And so classical methods tend to fail for this. And so that's why this is a good target for a quantum computer. It's important and it's hard. And so that's why we look at this as a particular example, because it's a, it's a fantastic case study of something that we would one day want to simulate in order to actually be able to probe reaction dynamics for any sort of industrial process. So, but again, the main question is, what type of quantum computer are we going to need for it? You know, is a small quantum computer of about 111 qubits going to be sufficient? Or are we going to need a bigger one? And if we want to do this at a sensible speed, how fast is this, is this going to be? And to me, this isn't just an academic question, because giving these kinds of numbers right now, I feel is an inspirational thing to let the experimentalists know what we're looking at for hard problems that we'll want to see solved down the line, so that hopefully we can meet in the middle with the hardware that'll be required to do this. So to give you an idea about you know, what this actually ends up looking like, is this is the whole protein that's responsible uh, for, for what we're looking at. So something that I thought before I started looking, looking at all of this is I assumed with a quantum computer, what you naturally would do is you would take this entire mess out here and encode that in qubits in the, uh, in the system, because that's just the most direct way of doing it. But it turns out that that actually isn't the information that chemists need. What hybrid me methods can be used where portions of the problem are solved classically and other parts are solved quantum mechanically. So the idea basically is this entire protein sheath kind of around the outside of this active site, almost all of that actually can be simulated classically very easily. The only part that we actually have to simulate quantum mechanically is this portion, which you can see zoomed in in that part of the protein over there. And so that's our goal. We wish to simulate this, uh, this part of the molecule and combine that with a classical calculation in order to give us all the information we need to figure out reaction rates. And so just to give you an idea, this is, in some sense, a strongly hybrid algorithm because of the fact that classical and quantum computation are going to have to be going on for us to real realistically be able to estimate these reaction rates. We have to start and generate particular structures, optimize them, compute the Hamiltonian terms, you know, those n to the fourth terms, or n squared, depending on how you do it. But I guess those n squared terms are a little bit easier, but I digress. So the four in the, uh, the, 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 we have to generate these terms, then feed them to the quantum computer. The quantum computer is the only thing that's, uh, that's used over here uh, in the quantum level. So we figure out energies from this, and those energies are passed back to the classical algorithm. They're combined with the classical part of the energy that's being uh, computed, and also entropic calculations. Because in order to figure out the reaction rates, we need to figure out free energy differences. And free energies are, have an entropic part and an energy part. Entropy is easy to get. The energy is hard to get. So that's all what we're doing here. And yes, um, cool. 
And so just to give you, again, an idea, Ryan did a great job of doing this, but I'll just recap it you know, in order to, in order to uh, jog the memory a bit. But basically, what the idea behind, behind what we want to do in order to simulate that quantum part of it is we want to begin by taking some physical molecule over here, and we want to map that to a quantum computer. So the way that we do this is we have to have a math mathematical model standing in the way. All right? So this mathematical model that, uh, that's going to be used in at least my talk for both of the methods that I'm going to be talking about is a second quantized representation. So uh, we, we use that and we just look up in a book. Uh, I, unfortunately, I guess this is a bad example because they don't really talk about second quantization here. But I like the cover better of this book, so that's how it made it. So anyways, the, uh, that's the basic idea. We take the physical system, we mathematically model it, and then we simulate it on a quantum computer. So how do these second quantized, uh, quantized models work? Well, what we do is we break up our space into a series of basis functions. These can be chosen in a number of different ways. And actually, a lot of the art of chemistry goes into selecting what basis functions are going to be needed in order to be able to do a calculation. Um, from my perspective, it's, it seems almost magical, actually, when you take a look at real pros who take a look at this, because they have a lot of insight that they, and domain expertise that they use for choosing the right functions uh, to represent it. These ones over here, these are just hydrogenic uh, uh, orbitals. So these ones are at least easy to understand. But in principle, you can pick anything you want for this problem. And so how it works with second quantize is just like you remember from you know, your, your uh, undergraduate chemistry courses. We have each of these individual orbitals over here. And they can, they can each take two electrons. One spin up, one spin down. And so what we do is we model this by occupation. We say, OK, well, if this orbital can have you know, two different configurations in it. We can store this as a pair of qubits, right? First qubit stores the, uh, whether or not there's a spin up electron. Second one stores whether or not there's a spin down electron. So in this particular case, where we've got a full orbital, the qubit representation would be 1, 1. This one over here would be 0, 1. And these over there would be 0. That's it. So that's entirely how the encoding ends up working. And the real art ends up coming in to choosing these orbitals in a smart way to make the Hamiltonian simple, and also to make the number of orbitals, i.e. qubits, that we need to represent the problem low. All right. So that's basically the idea. And so what we want to do in this process is the simulation go, typically ends up going as follows. What you do is you first begin by preparing the states, in, uh, the qubits, in some sort of a state. In our case, in order to figure out these energy differences, we really need to be able to figure out our, the energies. We need to be able to figure out what the, um, essentially the ground state energy is in different configurations. It's not always ground states. Sometimes you're interested in excited states. But for this problem over here, we focus on ground states. So first thing you do is you begin by preparing uh, the, the system in an approximation to the ground state. Common things to do is to begin with a mean field approximation to it, or adiabatic. There's a bunch of different choices, but you've got to start with something that is an approximation to the ground state. Then what you do is you compile the dynam dynamics. So this is where you do a dynamical evolution, very similar to what Andrew was talking about earlier. And at that point, you can use things like Trotter-Suzuki formulas to do it, which is the method that I'm going to be exclusively talking about in this talk. So then. Afterwards, we need to estimate the energy out of it. And so we use quantum phase estimation to be able to do it. And these things together form kind of like the cycle that we, we use in order to solve basically all of these problems. So in order to give you an idea about how this works, it, um, you could end up actually just looking at a Hamiltonian that's very similar to how Ryan ended up putting it. This Hamiltonian is a direct consequence of the Coulomb interaction. So when you write out the Coulomb uh, interaction for any orbital basis in general, unless there's symmetries, like the kind that we were seeing with a plane wave basis, you end up getting something that ends up looking like this with end of the, end of the fourth terms in it. And so these operators over here, just to give you an idea, they represent hopping. So this one over here says you kill an electron at site S and site Q and create one at site R and site P. This one over here just talks about hopping. It says you hop from site Q to, hop to site P. And so these are, these represent, you know, these are called one body terms and these are generally two body terms. And they just, the later describes uh, interactions between electrons. And that's the one that we're usually most vexed by when it comes to quantum simulation. So to give you an idea again about how many qubits we end up needing for this, a lot of, a lot of the, the, 
a lot of the, the optimism that ended up coming from this is that to do some of these molecules over here, you need a relatively small number of qubits. Now, these aren't natural targets, it turns out, for quantum simulation. The reason why is because these sorts of organic molecules, they tend to be very easily simulatable with existing classical methods, at least to the level of precision we need. But the key point is even large things like this, they don't typically require a huge number of qubits in order to represent them. So there's some optimism for that. Now, basically, as I said before, you know, what we really want out of this is we want the ground state energy in order to be able to estimate the reaction rates because that helps us figure out the free energy. But we need to really be able to get an idea of the costs and how many trotter steps, how much phase estimation we're going to need, and the like. And so that's where the majority of this ends up going, uh, the effort ends up going in. So from a theoretical level, the, the, perhaps the biggest pain with doing these sorts of cost uh, analyses is that when you're looking at this process, there's several steps that end up coming in uh, that end up impacting the error in the simulation. And we need to make sure the error in the simulation is sufficiently low that we um, are going to be able to accurately predict at least the direction that the chemical dynamics is going to go in. So we need to make sure that the error is less than something known as chemical precision, which ends up at least giving you that sort of information at room temperature. So the so sources of error that we end up getting that come into here are phase estimation errors. We get errors from using the Trotter formula in our case. And we also get errors from circuit synthesis because you know, if you've, you've got rotations that naturally end up showing up in these Trotter decompositions, and we've got to convert these to, a, uh, to Clifford and T gates. All of these things have errors that have to combine together, and we've got to balance them off in such a way so that we minimize the total number of operations to hit it. So, for example, you know, we might want to throw, you know, the majority of our error budget into phase estimation because the error scaling for phase estimation is pretty awful then throw some of it into the Trotter decomposition and throw basically like none of our budget into circuit synthesis because it's log logarithmic in cost. But formalizing that balance between all three of these in order to get an optimal trade-off, that's what actually ended up taking the majority of the work here and showing that these errors actually do lead directly, in the worst case scenario, to errors in the estimated eigenvalue. But there's another source of error that experimentalists tell me unfortunately exists. Believe it or not, gates aren't perfect. I know, it came as a shock to me too. But um, the point is, is that we're likely going to need error correction. And that's something I'm going to talk about later in a talk. How much error correction are we actually going to need in order to realize these algorithms? So to, as a bit of a review, to give you an idea of what phase estimation ends up looking like, is that we have a circuit that ends up looking like this. You can really think about it. You know, for those of you who haven't dealt with it much, this really is kind of like an interferometer. What we're doing is we begin with this qubit at the top in a state zero. We apply a Hadamard transform, which puts it in a superposition of zero and one. We've got a kickback phase over here, which is somewhat optional. And then conditioned on whether this bit is zero or one, we apply a unitary to this arm. Then we recombine both the paths and measure. And so the probabilities that we end up getting out depend on the phase that's accumulated in the path where the top qubit is one, because that's the only one where the unitary is applied. By measuring the statistics on the top, just like an interferometer, you can estimate what the eigenvalues are. That's the idea behind it. So we apply this, and by doing this a sufficiently large number of times, changing m and theta accordingly, what we can do is we can estimate what the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian are. And that's how we end up doing it. So that's how this part of it works. Now, for trotterization, again, the key point is that if we look at our Hamiltonians that we end up getting out of this, the Hamiltonian is naturally this monster up here. To give you an idea about how many terms we end up having in our Hamiltonian, we've roughly got about 10 million terms in the descriptions of these Hamiltonians. So these things are just monsters. And so there's no way that, I, that you're likely going to have this as a native gate on your computer. So the idea behind the Trotter decomposition really is just giving you a prescription for compiling this over here down to a bunch of rotation gates. Once you have these rotations, then you can implement those using, uh, um, using your favorite uh, operations in your gate library. So the way that you do it, basically, is you just apply the Trotter-Suzuki formula, which says, more or less, take this formula and pretend all the terms actually commuted. And um, uh, technically, for we, we symmetrize this over here, although for ground state estimation, it turns out 
believe it or not, the basic Trotter formula that isn't symmetric has exactly the same error scaling as the one that is symmetrized. It's surprising. It doesn't hold for dynamics, but for ground state estimation for these guys, it does. So that's what we do. And the idea behind it basically is kind of like a light switch, right? If you flick a light switch on back and forth over and over again really fast, it makes it seem like it's on the entire time. And that's what's happening with the Trotter decomposition. We want to simulate all of these individual Hamiltonian terms being on during the entire evolution. And so we, what we do is we rapidly switch between each of the individual terms. And the effect is, is if they were on the entire time. So that's how it all works. And in order to make the air small, what we have to do is we have to pick these t to be appropriately small in order to, in order to reduce the air. And so we do that. And the air, just in case you're curious, this value of uh, t that you end up having to pick basically ends up going like 1 over square root epsilon for this case. But what we have to do is we take each of these individual terms, though, over here, and we have to convert these into fundamental gates. And in order to do this, we have to choose a representation for our, our, our qubits. There's many choices. You can just go to the literature and find one that really fits your needs. Um, the three most popular ones right now are Jordan Vigner, Bravi Kitiev, and also there's this uh, really kind of slick encoding that I really like that Bravi and some other people at IBM did that can also be used. But we focus on Jordan Vigner, uh, the Jordan Vigner transform, because it worked a little bit better than Bravi Kitiev for, for our stuff. But um, that's basically how we do. And so the idea basically is the Jordan Vigner transformation takes these creation and annihilation operators and ends up expressing everything as a uh, pro uh, ex series of exponentials of polys. And basically, the way that we, we end up doing this is once we have these exponentials of polys given by the Jordan Wigner representation, we just flip to the appropriate chapter in Nielsen and Schwank and look at the methods that they propose for uh, exponentiating poly operators. And then you can execute it. Um, it. Turns out there's better methods that we also talk about in the paper than doing this. Uh, but nonetheless, the actual numerics are generated with this approach. So basically, what we have to do in order to do this is we have to execute a series of these templates. Okay, And so just to give you an idea, these sorts of circuit templates depend on the type of term that we're looking at. So for the one bo body terms, the HPP terms, they're very easy. They're just a phase that you have to apply to the, uh, the system. For the hopping term, things actually aren't so bad. Uh, what, you, what you have is you've got a, series, a pair of controlled rotations with these things. These things, by the way, are often called jordan Wigner strings, and they're used in order to um, compute, make sure that the, the creation and annihilation operators anti-commute rather than commute when they, they occur on different sites. And so that's basically the idea behind it. And incidentally, Ryan's fermionic swap trick uh, that he was mentioning during his talk is a fantastic way to remove the need to do those. But that's how these guys end up working. Now, for these terms over here that have two mixed indices where they're diagonal, circuit ends up looking also pretty similar. OK, so cool. Things are looking pretty OK. Uh, hopefully, nothing gets really gnarly when we go up. But once we get to three, things start getting a little more complicated. But four looks like this. Isn't that fun? Oh, uh, yeah, and the best part about it is these guys are actually the most numerous of all of the terms. Almost all the terms end up looking like this. And so when we're looking at a quantum simulation, we're going through a whole bunch of circuits over and over and over again that end up looking like this. There's optimize a few optimizations you can make. But basically, this is it. This is the bulk of what our quantum simulation is doing. Okay. So in order to figure out how all of these errors come together, one of the, the hardest parts about all of this, as Andrew rightly pointed out, is accurately estimating what the Trotter-Suzuki errors are. So the approach that we do is the, for ground state estimation, one of the things you can do is you can use perturbation theory in order to be able to figure out what the shift in the effective Hamiltonian is because of uh, the commutators that you've neglected from your Hamiltonian. Um, and you can use those in order to be able to generate a, an upper bound on the air. And so this upper bound over here for, uh, is, is our commutator bound in the, in, uh, the, the terms of the, that Andrew used. So we take into account that the air you know, depends on how these double commutators between the individual terms uh, end up appearing. And we throw that in there and then use a triangle inequality in order to be able to upper bound that. 
And so when we start taking a look at that, this is what we end up seeing. A Trotter number basically is how much I have to end up reducing the time by what fraction of it in order to make the error some fixed constant. And so for this over here, uh, what we end up seeing is this is empirical data down at the bottom. So you can see that with this empirical, empirical data that things are actually much, much, much better than oh, what the worst case bound ends up saying. So what we do is we say, OK, for most of the numbers that we provide in the paper, we give two things. First, we give upper bounds where everything has been upper bounded. We use the most paranoid possible calculation. And then what we also do is we couple this with, um, with empirical bounds. And because of the fact that it's hard to extrapolate what the scaling of the Trotter error actually is from this small sample out here, especially because these molecules have nothing to do in many cases with nitrogenase, which is out here, we, ha we have many choices about how we could extrapolate it. So what we, what we ended up doing is we ended up doing a couple of things. This blue line down here is really just like a least squared fit over the part that we could, we could simulate. And we get a very, very optimistic scaling. So I'll refer to this as the optimistic estimate from that. These other two lines over here are uh, kind of more pessimistic uh, rescaling. So what we do over here is we take the upper bound that we, do, that we can prove, and we, we assume, all right, let's assume the scaling from the upper bound is correct, but the constant isn't. So for this top line, what we do is we just take the, the scaling extrapolated from the upper bound and shift it down over here so that that scaling intersects with the, the largest point that we, we saw. And then we extrapolate up from that. This over here is we scale down the average, so that the average of this meets the average of that. And based on that, these over here, are the, the, that's nitrogenase up here, rescaled down to, uh, according to the average rescaling. So these are the values that we use for most of it over here. So that explains basically how we estimated what we thought the Trotter error is going to be for this large molecule that we really can't fully know what the Trotter error is going to be like uh, based on, well, the size of the simulations we can do. So to give you an idea about where this lands, and unfortunately, Andrew stole my thunder a little bit with this and gave away the order of magnitude of the gates. But one of the things you'll notice is that the number of gates, they're kind of daunting. They're 10 to the 14. Now, if you sit down and think about it, right, if you actually end up assuming, though, that you have a machine that can logically do uh, T gates at 100 megahertz, which is extremely fast, don't get me wrong, but let's assume that because it's kind of comparable-ish to what you can do with classical hardware, you actually would be able to go through this in a relatively short period of time, you know, depending on the amount of parallelism that you end up using. And these are some different schemes that we, uh, oh, that we use for it, uh, between 12 days and 11 hours. So a quantum, a quantum computer, in principle, if it were, if it had the ability to stay coherent for that length of time and was able to operate that quickly, it could actually solve these problems within a sensible amount of time. So that's, that's kind of great. Um, the number of qubits that we require also, depending on the amount of parallelism, because we play this trade-off, right? More memory, less time. You know, so if we look at the case that's mo most memory efficient, we only need a little over 100 qubits, logically, in order to be able to carry it out. So that part at least seems pretty good. But the key word that I, that I have to emphasize here is logically. If we have 10 to the 14 gates that we're carrying out in sequence in this trotterized phase estimation circuit, that, those error rates had best be pretty small, probably on the order of 10 to the minus 15 or so in order to make the final error probability small. So we're going to need error correction if this is right. And the question is, does error correction sink this ship? Right? And if, uh, or I guess more positively, what sorts of error rates would we like to be able to see in our physical hardware in order to be able to kind of deliver the sort of machine that could do this reasonably? And so basically, we've got a choice of different codes that we could use for this. And the one we cho chose to look at is the surface code. Main reason is because, well, the surface code is at, of great interest. It's got a very high threshold. It's arguably the, uh, one of the best studied codes around. So it was very easy for us to gadgetize and replace all of our components in our circuit with their fault-tolerant analogs because of the breadth of literature there. 
So that's what we end up looking at. And here are the re uh, results that end up coming out. Um, the key point down here is at the bottom. What we have is the, this column, I think, is probably the most interesting one. Uh, these are serial, those are just, this is just the serial algorithm, so we don't try to parallelize whatsoever with this. And these are different error rates that we, we ended up assuming. Now, for the error correction affectionados out there, if we assume that we're just an order of magnitude below threshold here, we need a pretty serious distance code for this. We need like distance 35 and two rounds of magic state distillation in order to carry this out. So that, that's some pretty serious overheads. If we end up getting down, though, a, three orders of magnitude below this, where some more exotic uh, quantum computing arch uh, architectures might be able to one day hit, we act, things become much more reasonable. We only need a distance nine code. And if we take a look down at the total number of uh, physical qubits required for this, the numbers that we end up seeing, if we're, if we're on the order of 10 to the minus 6 physical error, then we only need about 1.2 million uh, uh, qubits in order to hit that. If we're up on the order of a tenth of threshold, on the other hand, for this sort of thing, we're going to need about 100 million physical qubits. Now, if we parallelize in order to make this run faster, then things can start getting much more absurd. Uh, the most absurd being, you know, we could be at uh, 100 billion rotations if we want to be able to run this, or sorry, physical qubits, if we want to run this at maximum speed. So that is sort of the challenge that we have here. If this is a task that we want to do, then, and we want to be able to execute it within the, those times that I gave on the other table, then the scale of the quantum computer that we need to build is pretty much unlike anything that we've seen in our labs at present. We, we're, we're going to need to think about how to control millions of qubits. We're really going to th uh, need to think about how to reduce our errors substantially below threshold in order to be able to get to the place where this seems like a favorable trade-off. And also, we're going to need to make sure that we can have relatively fast gates in order to make all of this even make sense before you know, a bunch of other things start becoming prohibitive. But that's yet a hardware level. Now that we've seen these, level, these, these numbers, for people like myself at the algorithmic level, we need to start thinking differently. We need to start looking at new algorithms for being able to do this that can potentially cut this down. And again, going back to Andrew's uh, discussion, we need to start looking at some of these other post-trotter methods to understand how they work in these contexts to see if, in practice, they can start giving us numbers that are closer to where we want to be. But also, the other thing that we want to do is we want to perhaps reconsider how we represent our problems on the quantum computer. Because what happened with this problem is we chose a representation that is optimal for chemists. When chemists want to compute the energies, they use this, in this case, a triple zeta basis function that's based on Gaussian, uh, Gaussians in order to do it. But it wasn't designed for our needs in quantum computing. It wasn't designed to kind of trade off between accuracy and gate counts. And that's fundamentally the, opti the, the tweaking that went into all of these numbers up here. And our basis set design did not end up hitting that part. So one of the things that I feel needs to happen going forward is we need, if we want to really solve these problems, we also need to get chemists as an integral part of this loop. Because if we're not talking to them and figuring out the best ways to represent their problems on the quantum computer, we really are, I feel, going to have a hard time making the big leaps that we're going to need in order to make solving hard problems like this possible on the first generation of quantum computers, which ideally is something that I would like to see. But to that end, I'd like to, I'd like to talk about work that you know, Ryan, Ian, and I ended up doing, uh, pushing towards this, uh, uh, this goal in one way. So what we did is we started looking at a different problem. So we, we looked at the problem of trying to simulate the electronic structure problem for the plane wave basis. And in particular, we're looking at the plane wave dual basis, just like Ryan ended up saying. In this case, it's very nice because the Hamiltonian is actually expressible in a closed form. So this is cool because it means you don't have to talk to a chemist in order to be able to actually express the Hamiltonian. This is everything that you need to know. Whereas this triple zeta basis function that was used in order to represent the FOMOCO problem 
previously. That required a domain expert to tweak everything in order to be able to give us something that we could represent on our machine, or our simulated machine, as the case may be. Um, but in any case, we look at this and we focus on it because it's only got n squared rather than n to the fourth terms. And a problem that we want to want to simulate is uh, we want to, well, we want to use these plane waves because of this orthogonality property, and we want to be able to just um, find a problem that really is well suited for this, and also well requires pretty very little resources. And a problem, as Ryan ended up alluding to, that we end up looking at is jellium, which has the best name, the best name. I swear it looks nothing like this. I've always kind of wondered what color it is, whether it's more lime green or red, but I perhaps, perhaps I'll never know. But the idea behind jellium, again, is what you do is you just get a bunch of free electrons and let them kind of roam in a box. There's no charges, there's no nothing, they're just interacting with each other. And it's an, as Ryan said, it's an important benchmark problem and it's actually very important for understanding the foundations of DFT. So that's what we end up looking at. And, um, the numbers that you end up seeing from the simulation of uh, jellium are as follows. So this is the total T count. Now, one of the things that I should mention here is what we did that's a little bit different is that these are not empirical values for the Trotter error that we end up using. We ended up using an upper bound on it. But the reason why we ended up doing this is because there's order only order n squared terms. So we could actually explicitly construct the operator that to leading order describes the error in the uh, Trotterized decomposition and really come up with a good estimate for this case of what that was. In the case of the end of the fourth terms, we couldn't do it because the computational complexity was order n to the tenth for that calculation. Here, it's no problem. It was only order like n cubed or something. So, or actually into the, uh, into the fifth, I think. But anyways, the um, key, okay, maybe it's lower. But the point is, is that um, when we go through and do this calculation, depending on whether or not we're looking at 2D or 3D jellium, one of the things that we end up seeing is that as we end up increasing the number of, um, uh, number of plane waves in our problem, we end up actually getting to a point where we can get to pretty large systems and under a billion T gates. And the key point behind all of this is that these are upper bounds. If we put empirical numbers in, my suspicion is they're probably going to go down by a factor of 100. So this suggests that we actually, you know, once we change the basis, basis in order to be able to reflect the problem, we can actually get some pretty substantial savings. And my hope is that going forward, investigating what we can do with plane waves for some chemical systems and other problems of interest, that we may be able to see similar benefits where we can have substantial reductions to chemistry problems that we're interested in, just like we see for uh, this over here. And so to conclude, one of the things that I really want to impress upon you is that there really have been some dramatic improvements in quantum chemistry simulation. We've gone from n to the 10th algorithms down in this case to you know, something like a n to the 11th over three algorithm. Uh, and this is a really, really important because of the fact that we started realizing that chemistry is much more plausible than it's, been, than it's ever seemed. But the numbers that I'm, I'm showing are still a long way away from actually being something that we could realistically do on a short-term quantum computer. And I really want us to start thinking more as a community and working closer together in order to actually ask questions of what are the hard things that we want to solve on a quantum computer and how do we get all of the experts together at a table who may not necessarily even speak the same language that we need in order to be able to solve these problems. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Nathan, for that talk. Um, we have time for some questions. Do I go first? Well, this uh, cost analysis is with um, somewhat of an older algorithm, isn't it? It's not with Ryan's um, best scaling, the, the things in the table that had the best scaling. This is this data over here. Oh, is this a, okay but is actually for for that particular problem itself. We have not tried to work out what would be required in order to uh, do Fomoco using plane yeah. waves. 
Uh, one of the questions is, it's not clear to people like Marcus how many plane waves we actually would need in order to be able to represent it. So there's this debate about how large of a basis set is needed. And until we can re rectify that, it, we're going, it's, it's hard for me to be able to figure out what a realistic count is. I see. So that was a bit of an easy question. Maybe I could ask, if I gave you a quantum computer with a trillion qubits and a gigahertz um, clock rate, and you calculate these energies for the whole potential energy surface, and then you do the reaction dynamics, and you know the reaction rate now for Fomoko. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do that? What are you going to do with that to solve the? Uh, I begin by publishing <laughs> a paper, um, <laughs> but then after that, what I the key point it really is actually, and this is one of the things that is a big unknown. We can get reaction rates out of this, but that doesn't help us do what we really want to do, which is the problem of design. The problem of design is something that I really don't know. And you know, I've been talking to Marcus and people like that about how we could use a simulator like this in practice to do ab initio design. But I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done on a part of our community in order to understand how, we would, how these tools would really be used in practice by chemists who wish to solve these. So I think it's a great question and an open one. So uh, my question is, how important is the initial guess. If you improve that, will you then be able to cut down the size? Because some of these calculations, you can do a really pretty good job on a classical computer and then use the quantum computer to refine it. Excellent question. Thank you very much. So uh, just to rephrase it, uh, basically, classical computations are really, really powerful for many, for many things. And often, they can give decent guesses or hints about what the answer actually is. And how can we use that? Well, there's a couple of ways we can use it. The first way that we can uh, we could do is if we're doing phase estimation, we can use a prior distribution over what the phase is in order to really be able to give us a, uh, a estimate that takes advantage of all, our, of all of our understanding we have from classical methods, rather than starting from scratch. Second point is, is if we have a good understanding of what the gap is and other properties of the system, then we can actually use techniques like amplitude amplification in order to be able to boost the probability of success for the phase estimation step of this. But the most important way, I feel, is that a big red herring, or a big, uh, sort of the big, I don't know, uh, secret that we, you know, people often don't say, and I didn't talk about here, is that I talked about ground state preparation. This is actually just the cost for sampling from the eigen spectrum. I can't make a promise that this sample will be the ground state energy. It'll be an eigenvalue, but it won't necessarily be the ground state. And so by using our classical knowledge, we can direct the quantum system to give us the, eigen, the ground state with higher probability. And that, for, for highly correlated systems, having good chemical intuition about what that is may be essential for us to really make it work. Charlie Bennett had a question, and then I think Earl, and then we should move to the next speaker. Yes, the, well, the uh, Haber process it would be thermodynamically efficient, except you have to conduct it at high temperature and pressure, and so there are trade-offs to get it to go fast enough. But as I understand, the nitrogenase is pretty inefficient also in terms of its usage of ATP and things like that. So uh, I guess this is a good thing to look at, but there may be other, there may not be actually a big thermodynamic reward in learning how to do it the way nitrogenase does it, because it's pretty expensive for those little nodules under the ground on the clover, too. <laughs> okay, excellent point. Now, one of the things that I want to be most clear about is why we selected this. Now, I, I, I don't think we selected it. At least I, I didn't advocate for this because I thought we'd solve all the world's, the world's hunger by doing this. This was selected because of the fact that it's a, hard, it's a problem that's typical of a hard problem in catalysis. It's something that's been studied for a long time, and we know we don't have good classical approaches for it. Totally agree. You can't get that many metals together and doing something you don't understand very easily. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that, was one of the, that was the real reason why we ended up looking at it. Um, whether it would have an impact or wouldn't have an impact understanding this mechanism, that's something we can only tell after the fact. But nonetheless, I think that this is, a, this is probably one of the be better benchmark problems to look at for understanding catalysis as an application. Okay, and one last quick question from Earl. Oh, I had two questions. <laughs> well, you only get one. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> well, is it, one of them is a quick yes/no. The only the second one's rambling. So, the quick yes/no one was for the um, distillation factory. 
So there's this one trick that people often forget about, which is um, for the first round, you use like a smaller size surface code. For the second round, you use a bigger one. So did you do that? Yeah, we did. Brilliant. <laughs> That makes a huge difference. Yeah, it does. And the, the slightly rambling one was for the uh, Trotter Suzuki decomposition, which, if I understand it, the, that's kind of the bottleneck point in terms of the error. Is, um, is there any hope? I mean, I'm not an expert in these uh, Trotter Suzuki methods, but is there any hope that if you don't break it up into just individual terms, but groups of terms, and then try to synthesize a whole kind of E to the I, some collection of terms, um, that maybe that might cut the, the gate count down a bit? I'll give you the annoying answer because we've run out of time. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But I'd be happy to talk about okay. that later. Okay, so uh, let's thank Nathan again.